can't buy my silence You can't steal my voice You can't keep me quiet I will bring the noise Try to beat me down Tell me to shut my mouth But there's a time to speak And the time is now To start out, what has motivated you over the past years and why have you been doing what you have been doing? Well, I graduated from law school many years ago and uh, didn't, wasn't interested in practicing law. I was interested in becoming a writer and I was looking for a topic to write about. I was always interested in the intelligence community and nobody had ever written a book about NSA. So I wrote the very first book on NSA. It came out in 1982. And since then, nobody else has, uh, you know, come along to write books on NSA, so I've just kept doing it. I've, I've, so I've had a very big interest in it from the very beginning, and I've been uh, uh, trying to keep up to date with whatever NSA does. Um, you, you, I think you mentioned that in Body of Secrets early on, you were able to just walk into the NSA uh, headquarters and do interviews. Is that correct? Yeah, when uh, I first started writing, NSA was not anywhere near like it is now. Um, they really never anticipated anybody would uh, uh, be writing about them, and it was kind of amazing. I would actually drive up to the front door uh, while I'd park uh, in, the, in the parking lot there, um, and then I'd walk in the front door and, and uh, take a seat in the, in the little lobby they had there and get a cup of coffee and read a newspaper or whatever, and just try to get a feel of the organization. Uh, you can't get anywhere near the place now. I mean, it's wrapped in all kinds of fences and guards and electrified fences. So back then, it, it, you could just basically drive up to the front door. Um, I don't know if you caught the news uh, recently that the CIA is shutting down one of the offices for um, that that's in charge of declassifying documents. We, we use we in our in the course we use a lot of declassified documents. Do you think uh, too much information is, is coming out? What do you think is behind the shut shutdown of that office? Well, uh, I think they they wanted to probably shut it down for a long time, and now they have an excuse. Now that they have this uh, you know government cutback, the uh, sequester, and all that. So you know they're looking around for things to cut. That's probably the first thing on their list. Um, no, I agree with you that, uh, um, you know, people learn from history and, and uh, if you don't understand what happened before, you're probably going to do it again. And so I think it's a big mistake to always try to keep all this stuff secret. I mean, the NSA does that all the time. They keep, you know, if they have a lunch menu, they probably keep it secret. Uh, from looking at your interviews, I, I believe you're pretty familiar with a lot of the operations, uh, such as the Iranian Revolution in 1953, Ajax, Operation Northwoods, and, and Tonkin Gulf. Um, students sometimes, they have a hard time coming to terms with this information, and it paints quite a dark picture of international relations. So what can you say about what these documents reveal, uh, what your personal feelings have been, and your experience? with others when discussing um, this veiled history? Well, I agree. I think it's a very dark history. Um, you know, the, the CIA was set up by Truman. His original idea was just to put a lot of very smart people in an in a agency and have them analyze uh, information that came in. Uh, there wasn't a lot of, uh, there wasn't a lot of thought uh, into doing covert operations and all that kind of thing. It was basically trying to come up with good answers based on a lot of information that they're able to, to get. I mean, more more scholarly than anything else. And it's uh, the CIA has gone completely uh, the opposite direction. It, um, it never was very good at collecting intelligence. It just was never a very good intelligence agency. Um, and presidents would, would basically use it for whatever they wanted to, very nefarious purposes. Uh, Eisenhower uh, tried to uh, um, order the CIA to assassinate uh, Patrice Lumumba, the very first democratically elected president in the, in the entire continent of Africa. And then um, 
you know, he also uh, ordered the coup in, in Iran, um, which ended up putting the Shah in place and, and his torture police. And for 25 years, the people in Iran lived under the Shah, thanks to Eisenhower and the CIA. And, and so there's, um, you know, all these things that the CIA has done uh, that uh, are eventually get out, and they're just not very pretty. Just to remind students uh, that they can ask questions. They're a bit shy, so we're ready for any questions. Uh, uh, to the, yeah, okay. Okay, we have a question about Syria real quick. Hi. Um, Hi. I was reading in I was reading in the German magazine Focus and The Guardian that Obama's source on Syria and chemical weapons is based on Israel's National Security Agency, known as the 8,200 unit of the Israel Defense Forces. So, if this information isn't true and reliable, what makes it, what makes it different from President Obama to push claims that Iraq possesses nuclear weapons? In your opinion, thank you. Well, I'm not an expert on Syria, um, but I did write a book about Iraq, and I was over in uh, the Gulf for the first Gulf War, so I'm more familiar with that. Um, you know, the, the problem is that these intelligence agencies are, are wrong so many times, and so many people die because they're wrong. Uh, and they're wrong for the worst reasons. They're wrong a lot of times, not because... Their analysts aren't very good. They're wrong because the director wants to go along with the president. That's what happened in Iraq. Uh, with uh, the director of CIA was George Tenet, and uh, he just wanted to keep pleasing the president, George Bush, despite the uh, the uh, overwhelming amount of evidence showing that Saddam had no weapons of mass destruction. So he went along with it, and uh, as a result, the U.S. went into the uh, war and found no weapons of mass destruction. And I think that's what's uh, um, gotten a lot of people upset about the, the whole uh, aspect of Syria is that, you know, are we wrong again or are we being influenced by Israel, which has far greater interest in Syria than the U.S. should have? Um, so there's all these uh, interesting questions. I'm glad you're, you're asking good questions and studying these uh, issues. To I guess to finish off with the, the NSA topic again, sh should Americans and foreigners, because we have a lot of international, mostly international students from all over the world, sh should we be concerned about NSA spying? Uh, what are potential dangers to s s different citizens? And uh, do you take any practical precautions yourself, or you just kind of have given up? No, I, uh, ever since I began writing, I've never, ever done an interview over the telephone. I mean, I've never interviewed somebody else over the telephone, and I've never interviewed anybody via Internet. Every interview I've ever done has always been in person. Um, so I just never do those things over the telephone. I've never done them from the very beginning because, uh, you know, I mean, I'm from the very beginning, I've been, uh, the NSA has uh, never particularly liked me, so, um, so I take uh, precautions, but yeah, everybody I think has to worry about, it, especially if you're not in the United States. There's a, you know, the U.S. Uh, has no rules and regulations with what it does with the communications it picks up from Mexico or any other uh, country, and even in the United States, uh, what the NSA does uh, is so secret that we only find out after afterwards uh, that they're doing some of these things, like collecting all our telephone records and so forth. So, um, you know, the I try writing about these things, and some other people try writing about these things. It's really all I can do uh, because it's, uh, you know, this huge agency that I have no control over, and all I can do is try to write about it and alert other people to it. And I'm glad uh, you're, uh, you know, bringing this up in a class. I think it's a very important topic. Uh, many people still wonder, did they use the... I guess they use the phrase or the excuse, they say that if I have nothing to hide, if I haven't done anything wrong, um, that, that I shouldn't be worried. And then I think about hist historical examples with totalitarian regimes from Soviet Russia to Nazi Germany. So uh, how would you answer someone that says, you know, I have nothing to hide 
and so I don't think I should be worried. Well, uh, you know, Ted Kennedy didn't have anything to hide, uh, but he was put on the no-fly list. It took him three months to get off it. Uh, they make mistakes all the time. Just because you, you know, you haven't gotten a parking ticket uh, doesn't mean that you're not on the watch list someplace. Uh, you could have a son or a daughter that uh, is doing a project and they call up the North Korean mission in New York to ask a question or whatever. They send a letter there. Or they have a friend who has a friend who's in contact with somebody who's on the list. Uh, there's all kinds of ways uh, that you could be on the list. And you don't have to necessarily be on the um, no-fly list because there's a lot of people that are several steps below uh, do not fly. Um, so you could be on the list uh, without your knowing it for some innocent reason. And then, you know, if you have a son or a daughter that wants to go to Annapolis or West Point or you want to get a small business administration loan for the, from the government, you know, you might not get any of those things because somebody at, the, uh, at West Point or somebody at the Small Business Administration will check on these lists to see if you're listed anywhere and, and you may be on that list without you knowing it for some very innocent reason. And so somebody may not get into the college they want or you might not get the loan you want. I mean, those are just two simple examples. But this whole idea that um, uh, just because you didn't do anything wrong, you have nothing to worry about, I mean, that's a really pathetically uh, un unintelligent response. We have another student question, but just uh, on that point, other practical examples that we've seen in class are recently people reports of people posting to Facebook uh, co critical comments of governments and being visited by government agents. And there was one case of Brandon Raub, who was basically kidnapped by the government. I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Brandon Raub. Um, I'm not. Uh, I don't think I am familiar with that. Uh, no. Okay, we have another student question here. Okay. Um, yeah, um, I uh, I read an article of yours just recently, um, and it seems like uh, there's been, well, over the last, I don't know how long, um, at least decades, a huge, uh, huge spending of money on, uh, on cyber warfare. And my question is, how great is the uh, cyber warfare, warfare threat? Uh, foregoing the ethical questions regarding invasion of privacy, is the extent of U.S. investment in what cyber warfare warranted? Um, well, yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, I just did the uh, cover story for Wired magazine on on the cyber command <clears throat> and the person who runs it, General Alexander, who also runs NSA. Um, yeah, I think that it's a big worry. That's uh, it's right. The reason I wrote it uh, for Wired and the reason they, you know, gave me a lot of space on the cover and so forth because it is a important topic that's coming up that nobody's really talked about. Now, the United States is the very first country in the world that has ever launched a destructive cyber attack uh, that's ever really launched cyber war. Uh, we, uh, the United States launched it um, against Iran, the uh, centrifuges in the Natanz uh, nuclear enrichment plant. Um, and that, was, that showed basically what can be done now on this new world of cyber warfare where you can not just go to somebody's computer and wipe it out or put a piece of malware in there to, uh, um, you know, disrupt the person's computer uh, work. You can actually uh, use the internet and use uh, cyber to destroy things. You could destroy an entire power plant or a dam or an entire infrastructure, a power infrastructure. So that's where the U.S. is moving, is it's moving into the direction of developing these cyber weapons. And other countries are developing cyber weapons, too. The problem with the United States launching a cyber war or a cyber attack against a, a country is uh, a country like Iran, for example. Um, the U.S. is far more vulnerable than any other country in the world to a cyber attack because we have so many things uh, con connected to the Internet. So um, the U.S., I think, is in uh, you know making bad mistakes by, by 
using cyber warfare around the world because it will come back to haunt the United States. The United States will get attacked at some point, and uh, there's no reason to start the world on the path of cyber warfare. And yes, it's very expensive, as you mentioned. Uh, it's uh, it's just one more area for the U.S. to waste money on. Yeah, we have a question from France here. Uh, hello, yeah. I'm Victoria from France. Uh, I was uh, I wanted to ask a question about that. That we can say that uh, America is like a superpower right now. So, is there any threat from other countries, from the emerging countries? And do we think that this superpower that they have geopolitically and and economically is going to switch? Do Do you have any opinion about that? Uh, if you just ask the last part of the question again, do we, does the U.S. have any uh, threats, emerging threats from other countries? Is that what you're saying? I, I think she basically asked that. So the U.S. is the superpower that the world has to worry about. But are, are there any other um, threats in terms of cyber warfare? I mean, I would guess like Russia and China are also developing. So what what other threats w would you say exist? Well, Russia and China are developing them, um, but uh, the threat from China is economic. It's not. Uh, it's not uh, military. Uh, military uh, threat, or it's not a threat of of cyber warfare. The U.S. continues to complain about the Chinese, and what they do is they come in and they they find um, um, they find out uh, uh, ways to basically steal intellectual property like uh, how things are made or, or whatever, how, um, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, corporate secret, that kind of thing. Um, but that's a far cry from uh, from blowing something up in a country. When you blow something up in a country, that's an act of war. And the United States is the only country that has ever committed an act of war with cyber. It's when we blew up those, uh, those centrifuges in uh, in Iran. So, um, yeah, to answer the question, though, cyber is also sort of a poor man's uh, uh, weapon because unlike nuclear weapons, which are very, very difficult to get and very difficult to make um, and very difficult to hide, uh, cyber weapons, uh, you don't need a, a massive country or you don't need a plutonium or uranium or heavy water or any of those ingredients. All you need are smart people with a computer. And um, so uh, that's why it's a very dangerous area because you can live on a little island and if you have the right people and the right uh, cyber connections, you can do an enormous amount of damage. Uh, so um, that's, you know, that's a key factor in the whole issue of cyber warfare. Okay, two final quick questions. The, the first is, um, Germany, there's all this discussion going on uh, in the German government regarding the NSA spying, and we know that the NSA has been uh, spying on the European Union and the United Nations. Uh, one student had the question, do you think that the Ger people in the German government were aware of this spying, or do you think it was a complete surprise shock to them? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, the, uh, I think the uh, well, first of all, the United States is in Germany have cooperated uh, ever since the end of World War II in terms of eavesdropping. The U.S. built enormous eavesdropping capabilities in the in Germany, and have worked closely with the Germans for decades to um, develop eavesdropping capabilities uh, during the Cold War. So. I think that the uh, the the intelligence people certainly knew what the capabilities were and what NSA's proclivities are and what they were probably doing. I'm not sure exactly how much they knew, but I'm sure that they they were the ones who gave them the permission to link into their systems and so forth. Um, but w how high it went beyond the intelligence people, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I don't think that the German legislature had any idea, um, of the German parliament, and I don't. Uh, I don't know how much uh, the prime minister Merkel may have known. Um, you know, she may have been briefed very, very uh, um, uh, quickly by saying, uh, you know, we have this request from the Americans and they want to. Um, have access to some of our 
communicate with technology and they're going to share what they have with us and that kind of thing and she would say okay um, without knowing all the, the details and some of the details that have come out is that you know the United States has, uh, uh, has uh, picked up I think it's something a half a billion communications a, a month or something which means that the NSA has taps on the fiber optic cable going in and out of Germany. It doesn't mean that there's a tap on everybody's house. It just means that there's a, a tap on, on the, the pipes, the uh, uh, fiber optic cables going in and out. Um, finally, I believe your last book, if I'm not mistaken, was Shadow Factory. Um, are, you, yeah. are, you working on an, are you working on another book for the future? No, um, um, not right now. I'm just uh, working on articles, and I'm doing a, working on a new documentary for uh, PBS. Um, you know, I did a, a documentary for PBS a couple of years ago that was based on my book, uh, The Shadow Factory. Uh, the, the documentary was called The Spy Factory. Um, and I spent half my career in television. I was the uh, investigative producer for Peter Jennings, and then I've done a number of documentaries for PBS. So in addition to writing books, I also uh, do documentaries. So right now I'm just working on another documentary. I think there's going to be a lot of people writing books on this whole Snowden affair and the um, the revelations coming out about NSA. <coughs> Excuse me. And I don't, I'm not particularly fond of a lot of competition. So I don't think I'm going to go out and uh, try to compete with everybody else writing these books right now. I'll wait till it's little quieter out there and then I'll go write another book probably. And, you, and finally, any word of wisdom for the next uh, generation of future uh, diplomats and humanitarian workers and <laughs> the students studying international relations? Well, I just think that uh, uh, this is a good head start. You've got a really good class there, Professor, that you know uh, introduces your students to all these uh, ideas and, and getting the actual people to uh, address these issues. But, you know, I, it's basically like uh, when I went to school, I could have been a writer. I mean, I, rather, I could have been a lawyer. I graduated from law school. But, um, you know, I, I thought trying to find out what, what's going on in the world and writing about it and trying to inform people and, and uh, you know, digging really deeply into what the government's doing and how it's working. I always thought that was... Uh, uh, you know, I probably wouldn't never make the kind of money I would make as a corporate lawyer, but I, I have a lot more, I think, uh, satisfaction in being able to uh, do this kind of work. So I would always encourage people to think about writing and particularly investigative writing because we we never have enough uh, investigative writers, uh, and I'd always be happy to see more out there. Okay, well, we'll take that into account. Thank you so much for your time, and we wish you all the best on your future endeavors. Well, thanks, uh, Professor. I enjoyed uh, speaking to your class, and best luck to all your students. Tried to be a good boy, but I ain't a boy no more. I've seen some things that a man just can't ignore. And this world's gonna see what I'm standing for. I've kept my peace. I can't hold my tongue anymore